everyone. Welcome to Local Bias. I'm Marion Kellner, your host for today, and I am very excited with our guest today, Sue Pratt. Hello. Who is a very valuable member of our community working in the elder care field. So welcome, Sue. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I am really, really interested in this topic as I think many of the people who are watching are. Mm -hmm. So elder care, I'd like to start first with you just giving some background, just who you are, introduce yourself mm -hmm. a little before we dive in. I'd be happy to. So for me it started, um, well, it started as it does I think for many with my grandparents. So I absolutely adored my grandmother, Italian immigrant farmer, um, and when she became frail and was placed in a nursing home, I visited once. It didn't seem to hold any appeal. I didn't like the place, so I never went back. Uh, and when she died at her funeral, so many people were there speaking about her in um, really recent stories and showing scrapbooks that she'd made. So I thought I better get a handle on this uh, aging business. And I went to a nursing home, applied for a job, they hired me, and immediately I was caring for really frail uh, elders and pretty scared and no training, no preparation. And uh, something magical happened. I found that the connection was transformative for me. The level of intimacy uh, and the, uh, the opportunity to make such a positive difference in a person's life. So that started the, the path for me, and that was, I was 16, so it was a few years ago. And I've kind of stayed on track with elders in many different forms ever since. All right. So I understand you were connected with Greenfield Community College, and you've established a collaborative? Yes. So about 13 years ago, about 14 years ago, uh, with a small group, we created Trip Memorial Foundation a nonprofit organization to serve elders and caregivers in kind of ancillary, not direct care, but supportive ways, and training was one of the big needs. Uh, we, I, I created collective home care in the late 90s to provide home care services and quickly realized that we needed well-trained caregivers and there really wasn't a program available. So partnered with Greenfield Community College uh, to provide a, a rotating rounds of certified nursing assistant and home health aid training. We've also done a lot of grant work with them, worked on state curriculum, uh, to anything that we could do to improve the recruitment and retention of direct care workers. Yeah. And we're still there. Good. So I just, in listening to you, and I hear you say the word elder, mm -hmm. uh, growing up we always heard of the elderly. <laughs> You know, which makes, if you call anyone the elderly, it, it doesn't sound so good, right? And the word elder mm -hmm. has a sense of respect and strength and uh, sort of status in society. So uh, yes, I'm happy to hear the use of that word. Yeah, I think the idea of the elderly, like they're separate from the rest of us in some way. And in fact, we're all on our way we're all eldering, and if, if all goes well, we'll get there. Yeah. Um, so, and also I think that many cultures really respect the wisdom of the elders and think of them as repositories of uh, history and knowledge of the community and uh, the family and the culture. So that's the approach that I take. Yeah. So uh, the state of elder care in the United States is seems to be, uh, sort of dire on a number of levels. I know this is your passion and you're doing everything you can <laughs> to try to improve it. So what are some of the main issues as you see it? Well, um, the, the first place to start is the budget. So we talk about or we hear about the entitlements, the entitlements and social security and will there be enough? Um, and so we can't expect that there'll be more money put into the system to pay for these entitlements for Medicaid and Medicare. At the same time, it's the fastest growing sex segment of the population. So the statistic is about 10,000 people a day in this country turn 65 and will for the next 15 to 20 years. 
So with that being said, we have a great need. People are living older, which means they're more frail often. Uh, we're, there's more need for geriatric expertise and care, which doesn't really exist. Um, and at the same time, the pool of direct care workers is shrinking, uh, partly just demographics, partly because we have a, a, a smaller pool of immigrant uh, workers who generally uh, very often do this work and because the economy has improved and people who may really feel called to direct care work can't afford to take that oath of poverty and and get into the profession or they move on to nursing or social work or something that is a more viable way to live right so I think it's an important point, the fact that immigrants mm -hmm. have traditionally played a very major role <clears throat> in this field, and now with all that's going on, right. that's diminishing. And that this field that is so difficult, you know, my mother was in a nursing home in the last nine months of her life, and I got to witness the care, mm -hmm. the loving care that she was given through, you know, all the permutations of what it is to be old and sick. And mm -hmm. that work is hard, it's mm -hmm. uh, constant, and the pay is almost nothing. All the caregivers there had to have at least one other, if not very two often, other jobs. Very often, yes, or a benefactor of some kind. Yeah, yeah that's very true. Uh, so minimum wage has increased, and we're grateful for that, but that's made this work uh, even less attractive because with far less responsibility you can work uh, at a, a chain store or you know do, it, that so that has made it more difficult uh, often a, a nursing assistant in a facility a nursing home will carry an assignment of eight to ten and that's a good assignment of eight to ten uh, residents that they're responsible for so time management is is a tremendous component the amount of skill required uh, to manage all of that is uh, is really dense, yeah. and, um, and it is a lot of responsibility. And imagine that for twelve dollars an hour. Yeah. Well, I think also uh, the budget is a challenge, mm -hmm. and the societal as well as the individual view of getting older mm -hmm. and the denial of getting older mm -hmm. and the denial of, uh, of being sick mm -hmm. and so forth is another barrier to a very rational, comprehensive approach to elder care. Yeah, both on an individual and on a societal level. So uh, individually, what happens uh, for many, m most people that we meet uh, as professional caregivers, we meet when they're in crises. They've had an event, a, a healthcare crisis, or somehow their living situation is no longer appropriate. Uh, so now they don't know anything about elder care. They don't know anything about the models of care or availability of care, and they're entering in crises, and very often not terribly satisfied with what they find. Uh, and so, you know, in the midst of trying to just provide basic comfort. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, focus on the well-being of the person, you're also having to orient them to this new land of frailty and chronic illness and uh, Medicaid and Medicare, and it's, it's a little overwhelming. So, uh, and, and so we as a society just haven't looked at that. I'm always amazed with this fact that there are more nursing homes in our country than McDonald's, but you know, really? yeah. But they don't have those big, proud, golden arches announcing their presence. They're tucked on side streets, and you know we don't talk about nursing homes. Most of us don't go near nursing homes, right? Um, <laughs> unless we're having to be there or a loved one is. Yeah. Uh, most people would prefer to stay home. Uh, there's a tremendous shortage of direct care workers who are able to work in home care for a number of reasons. Uh, so. That's a big part of our mission. My mission is to uh, hopefully uh, improve that recruitment, help everyone to understand this is what's happening, and uh, really in increase the awareness in our society and our community, and then train everybody who is interested. And maybe it's only one neighbor that you help, or maybe you only do a Saturday afternoon, or help to make supper for someone. But you know, I think if all of us had some more skill and some more knowledge, we could do much more. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. So facing that fear of getting old, getting sick, that it can happen and it will happen it will. if we live long enough yeah. to ourselves to uh, deal with the budgetary mm -hmm. uh, issues. And so what, what sort of um, solutions do you see? What are you working on that uh, is contributing to the solution to these problems? Well, I'll tell you, when we started at GCC <clears throat> 13 years ago, um, when I created the nonprofit, we thought there were, there were um, plenty of grants to apply for. There were state initiatives. There were, uh, um, you know, funding for uh, sponsorship of students to take the training. If you received food stamps, you might get funded. Uh, lots of um, transitional assistance and supports for people who were unemployed. The economy wasn't so good. There was money in that pro in the career centers. Um, and as I said, we had a lot of state initiatives through Executive Office of Elder Affairs or Department of Public Health. Uh, there was almost never a time that it wasn't something to apply for, um, for funding, which we did, and we've been very successful. In the last few years, we've seen that dry up almost completely. There are no grants to apply for. At a time when we need caregivers more, uh, employers are desperate. Uh, the Career Center's funding has been cut so drastically in our community that we've closed the Northampton office of Franklin Hampshire Career Center. Uh, we have very few students sponsored because of the funding situation. So what we've done is create a thrift shop, Giving Circle Thrift Shop in South Deerfield. We opened in April, and our goal is to uh, ask the community to support this through donations of goods, uh, of items, uh, household items and clothing and toys, which we can sell to um, raise funds to support training and life enrichment activities for caregivers, as well as give the caregivers a discount through their membership at the thrift shop and, and asking other local merchants to support with discounts these caregivers to have a better quality of life so that they can in turn provide uh, a higher quality of care and feel more prepared and energized to provide this work. So that's our newest uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, it's working. We're new. It's very exciting. But, you know, most of us have stuff. It's kind of, you know, that's the center for this consumer society. We like stuff, we like buying stuff, and then we have too much stuff. So if they give us the stuff and we sell it to <laughs> someone else, it seems to work. So we're kind of circumventing the uh, budgetary issues mm -hmm. by creating an economy of, uh, a community economy of support. Yeah. And it's allowing people to really hear and see and think about and story tell and show appreciation for these workers. And we've, we've been getting great feedback. Yeah. I've been to the store, The Giving Circle, and it's just an amazing place. First, the, the vibe, you know. Thank you. Is incredible. The actual pl place is beautiful. The clothes are great. Um, and the causes couldn't be better. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I was also thinking, you know, about all these movements now, like the Me Too movement mm -hmm. and um, Elder care, taking care of people in the family, always been women's work, yep. right? Usually unpaid mm -hmm. in the home. And it, I'm sure, has just sort of permeated mm -hmm. the perception of elder care and the wages and the expectations. So how do you see the connection between it being women's work and the state of elder care? Well, there are, boy, there are layers uh, of things to talk about there. I think that uh, it, it wasn't even considered paid uh, work. It was considered a woman's responsibility until not that many decades ago. Until 1989, there were no standards of practice whatsoever for uh, geriatric care in nursing homes. There was no mm -hmm. oversight, and there were no standards and no training requirements. Uh, that's just a little while ago. Yeah, and uh, you know we, and it's, you know we just figured it out. And mostly, women cared for family members. And then, with women entering the workforce and all kinds of other changes, and and with with people living longer and longer, uh, and also with much more complex healthcare issues, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we call it the kind of quicker, sicker discharge from a hospital. Oh. So there was a time when you know you would go into the hospital for a procedure, uh, whatever, and you'd be in a week or two weeks. Uh, maybe you have an infection, and you'd be in throughout your course of antibiotics, and, and, and you know until you felt strong enough to go home and be independent. Now, it, you know what could have been a two-week hospital stay could be an outpatient procedure. Wow. So you're going home either to family or to a facility, uh, but if you're going home, they're looking for uh, family caregivers rather than paid caregivers, and generally it was considered women's work. So it's only been, I would say, even recently we've talked about whether or not direct care workers in a home care situation should, if it's, if it's uh, work that would be uh, worthy of overtime if you work more than 40 hours, I mean, these are basic uh, labor laws that we've had to fight for very recently in the home care profession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as nannies have, really. It's yeah. the same. Yeah. And that, again, talks about the immigrant population. Mm -hmm. Because for many other cultures, it is just more of a natural thing to care for your own family, to care for the elders in your community. They move in with you or you move in with them. And so that's another issue in our society, is that we live separately and we live, you know, many miles apart often. Yeah. So. Yeah. So another factor that I think is interesting is that um, the caregivers go into a home, they're faced with a person who is traumatized, mm -hmm. right? We're all traumatized, we suddenly find ourselves old and infirm and mm -hmm. with enormous loss and resentment and depression. There are some cheerful older people. <laughs> My mother was one of the she cheerful was. older yeah. people. But uh, I don't know if I'm going to be one of the cheerful ones. but to give uh, our listeners some sort of a sense of what the caregivers face. They're, they're coming in to help mm -hmm. and they're faced with somebody who sort of resents them being there because it reflects mm -hmm. where they are in life. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very important perception that people need to have and understand. Well, I think, first of all, I guess I would say this. I think it's a tremendous act of courage for an elder to receive care, for all of us to receive care. But in a, a facility, or think about in a home care situation, allowing a perfect stranger into your home to help you to disrobe and to bathe, to trust you to clean their home and to cook their food, when maybe you've never you know, had any of those kinds of supports before, you've always done everything yourself. And independence is very important, especially to this population of elder women. They fought hard for this independence for the right uh, to, to be, have that kind of autonomy and so to be marginalized in any way in a facility uh, where your privacy is really compromised, uh, it's shocking, I think, for us. I think the whole thing is shocking. We, people aren't prepared for getting old and frail. Yeah. Uh, but then for receiving care, accepting care, feeling worthy of care, we don't know as caregivers what kind of history this person may have, what kind of traumas maybe they've lived through, uh, how to enter a case, uh, to enter a, a client, a resident's room or a client's home is very important, which is why education is very important, as well as the support and the coaching, uh, mentoring for these caregivers who are um, experiencing compassion fatigue on a regular basis. Because you're right, they may not be thanked, they may be rebuffed, and people who are resisting this care, uh, that can be uh, daunting to not take it personally, to have the empathy to just, you know, reapproach, try again. Uh, figure figure out how do I make this connection in order to support the well-being of this person. That's a lot of skill. A lot of skill. Uh, and it doesn't come naturally to everyone. Yeah. Many care caregivers feel very called to the work and uh, they, the, the connections are considered sacred. Uh, uh, but it's very important to me that we prepare people for uh, the the positions and also prepare the society to think about in advance of being in crises with a healthcare crisis, what happens when I can't drive at night? What happens when I can't do the stairs? You know, what happens when I can't perform all of my activities of daily living independently? 
what will I do then? Yeah. The more we plan, the, the easier it all will be, really. Right. So that brings you also to uh, society's aversion to talking about dying. Oh boy, yeah. You know, it, it's the whole thing on so many levels of mm -hmm. women's work, uh, <laughs> getting older, uh, issues of dying, what society values, doesn't value. It's just huge. Mm -hmm. Elder care is huge. Mm -hmm. What um, message would you like to give people who are listening, you know, about, um, I know you're very, very passionate about this subject. Um, if you could tell them some things that you'd like them to keep in mind, uh, or resources, or anything like that, do you have oh, Well, I have plenty. Ideas? I think the most important thing is to think about how, how enhanced all of our lives are uh, by inclu the inclusion of elders uh, um, and how it is our future. So if we don't want to think about aging and we don't want to look at it and we want to pretend well, it'll never happen, then we're, we're not ever going to feel prepared as a society or as an individual. Uh, one thing I like to tell every class that will listen to me or every person that will listen to me is that, you know, uh, the, 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 the growth and development, the stage we get to a certain point and then our bodies start to decline. That's the natural part of being a human being. It's, it's supposed to happen. Body systems shut down over time. And we just don't want to talk about that. The highest compliment we can give each other is that you don't look your age. Oh, you couldn't possibly be 60 and 90's the new 80 and 80's the new whatever. <laughs> uh, so I think that if we started to understand the value in elders in our society and in the preparation for that. So, you know, children learn by repetition. It's just true, we know this. Tell me again, tell me again. I'm a grandmother now, and I can tell you I could, I could recite the entire script of certain movies that I've watched repeatedly. <laughs> they want to watch it again and again. When you age, short-term memory gets a little more compromised in a normal, healthy, aging person. I'm not talking about dementia. But elders often repeat themselves, the same stories. It's part of making sense of your life. It's, part, it's just a natural part of the aging process. Uh, so elders repeat and children learn by repetition. So this is a natural part of life. I think children should be at the feet of elders hearing stories of their culture. And uh, so that's probably the, the the thing that I think I'm most passionate about is to be inclusive of all ages uh, and to understand that the best way to know how to live is to talk with someone who has and has learned from their life experience. It might all not be the greatest life experience, but valuable nonetheless. And so if we saw this as an opportunity uh, to deepen our own humanity, rather than as a, a job to disdain, you know, oh, who wants to have to do that? It's really the most uh, sacred and, and intimate and human work that there is. And even if you don't do it every day as, as a, a paid direct caregiver, uh, if you can start thinking about in your own circle, how will we age together? Mm -hmm. That's probably the most valuable pointer I could give anyone right now. Yeah. And it seems like there's a sort of a slight societal shift toward that, you know, that there are groups, death and dying groups, mm -hmm. just to talk about it, to read about it. Um, that's very valuable. I mean, I, I agree that the more there's a multi-generational environment, mm -hmm. the richer mm -hmm. everyone's life is. Mm -hmm. People, I know it's true of me, when I was young, I never believed that that old person was ever young, <laughs> right? It was like somehow they appeared on earth, you know, at 70. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> even if I saw pictures of them when they were young, it was like, you know, right. you can't make the connection. So to be able to break that down and to see the humanity behind uh, the aging process it, is incredible. So mm -hmm. I think the multi-generational thing, they have a program in uh, Burlington, Vermont, Seniors for Seniors. Mm. So seniors from high school teach 
uh -huh. seniors <laughs> about computers and all the different technological things yep. that are sort of leaving my generation behind, right? Uh, I think being around young people helps older people sure access does. the world as it is today. Yeah, yeah. As does being around old people help young people to be more uh, um, kind of globally aware of the human experience rather than, uh, you know, I think there's a sense of immediacy mm -hmm. and immediate gratification uh, that, that, um, younger people have now and there's something very lovely about slowing down and hearing a story maybe that you have heard before but hearing it a different way this time or thinking about it in context uh, I, I I grew up around my grandparents and then dismissed them when they became elders uh, and I regret that and now I'm a grandmother and I see uh, my relationship with them is unlike any relationship that I've ever had. And I think part of it is that I know I won't be here for all of their lives. I, you know, it's their, there's a, it's a different, I, I'm, they're part of the legacy mm -hmm. in a very different way than my daughter when I was in the logistical phase of life and figuring out how to make a home. Um, now I'm thinking about how to leave a home. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, not that I plan on that happening immediately, but really what do I want to teach them? What do I want to leave with them? And what have I found to be most valuable? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that um, for me, it's just, it's been, when I think about that first woman that I cared for that first night in the nursing home in the bathroom, scared to death, I, I, I think of her name as Grace. I'm sure it wasn't Grace, but it was a, a moment full of grace. So I refer to her as Grace. <clears throat> the fact that she had some advanced dementia um, and was impaired a bit in, in language meant that we had to find other ways of communicating. And the ways that she also, without words, tried to reassure me uh, was life-changing. Uh, you know, you think about how much we all are trying to be in the present moment or relax and, 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 and kind of... T uh, to be out of the stress of, of life all the time and finding various different ways to do that. And I, th I think meditation is great, but so is spending an afternoon with an 85 year old who is more in the present moment than they've ever been yeah. in a lifetime. Yeah. So. The word that comes to mind in listening to all this is courage. Mm -hmm. You know, the courage of the elder, the courage of the caregiver. The time has flown by. We're at the end of our conversation. I've really learned a lot, and it's been very moving. Well, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you. And so, uh, guest is Sue Pratt, and thank you for listening to Local Bias. And um, you will get some information on how to contact these different organizations. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.